Uh, welcome to Red River podcast episode number 89. Uh, today, you know, the podcast is basically all things music, movies, and pop culture. And I feel like you are basically, you cover every box. Um, <laughs> your, your life is basically everything that we talk about. So um, doing, a, doing a deep dive on, on everything that you've done, your career is a very overwhelming, <laughs> but also... Yeah. Yeah, right. But it, it but it also is like so cool for us to have you. So Simon Boswell, thanks for doing the show. Well, um, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm very pleased to be here. Cool. Um, so anyway, l- l- let's kick it off by just saying, ha- asking how you're doing now as a live musician. Uh, things seem to be opening up now. Uh, I bet you're itching to play, right? Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and already making plans to do so, though it's a little difficult <laughs> to know exactly mm-hmm. when what is going to open up and in what countries so yeah but yeah um strangely you know for someone who's spent the better part of my life in in a, in the recording studio writing music writing and recording music playing live is the thing i really enjoy doing i mean yeah, yeah. yeah. me too like i i still play in a band and uh like playing like i love the writing i hate recording uh, but I, I like the writing, the creative part of it. I love practicing and I love playing shows. Um, the actual recording part of it is is the stuff that, you know, you're a musician, you know, you got to play the same thing over and over again until it sounds right. And then you got to do the mix. And then you basically listen to the same songs over and over again to make sure that everything is fine. And two weeks after it's released, you hate it anyway. That's that's a pretty accurate summation, yeah, of my job. I somehow think sometimes I I would be better employed by the CIA, really, in terms of just repetition of things, uh, you know, or making people listen to some of my ugly cues until they <laughs> until they confess. Well, it's funny that you you mentioned that because I know you and I are both big James Bond fans. So, um, I, I love James Bond. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So g- growing up, uh, you know basically kind of where you know i I would imagine james bond was from like growing up as a kid like let's just take that like how how did you come across james bond in those movies because to me i was a roger moore guy i I would assume you probably got in at sean connery it's the era you came up in yeah 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 i mean i I, i'm a little bit older maybe a fair bit older than you guys um so yes i mean dr no was the first uh, film that I saw because though, though the books were around I'm sure I didn't read the books first though you know but um, yeah I mean Dr. No, Sean Connery that was that was my first taste of the whole Bond experience you know and it's just it's, it's such a British phenomenon but it has obviously taken taken over in the rest of the world too but yeah I I, um, I love them I love all of, all of them actually but just like you know, you know, when when your band has like you know, like ACDC uh, goes from Bon Scott to Brian Johnson, like when you're a kid and now you get Roger Moore, like how did you, how does that make you feel? <laughs> well, I I I honestly I don't think I think I was probably not young enough. I'm not old enough to sort of be that invested in okay. being betrayed by the fact that Sean Connery was no longer Bond. Uh, it didn't affect me to that extent all right know, so so you know. so it, it wasn't until timothy dalton took over is what you're saying basically <laughs> <laughs> i have met one bond actually i met oh no i met two i, I met pierce brosnan okay uh, at a certain point it was it was funny actually you know just from doing from doing being a film composer you know i've i've been in studios and hanging around you know the film world quite a lot and I remember someone, there's one of one of my agents actually said, Oh, there's this kid who who really wants to come and work for you for free. And it turned out to be someone like Barbara, Barbara Broccoli's grandson or nephew or something. Yeah. And uh, it so happened that that was the time when Pierce Brosnan was making Goldeneye. Okay. And he said to me, So hey, come come down the set, you know, come and meet everyone. So and, and in fact, I took my son at that point, who was 12 to meet Pierce Brosnan and, and, you know, uh, everyone on the set. So that was kind of, kind of a cool experience. <laughs> and and I mean, well. you got like, I'm, I'm sure like your kids probably think of you as like a cool dad because, uh, you know, you, you do have like a cool job, you know, you, you, you are 
you know, when you're involved in the arts, man, and, and like music and movies are so, I mean, I, I just for us, I mean, like we have a podcast where we talk about it. You know, we've played in bands. We're so entrenched in that life. You know, uh, music and movies are basically everything. You take that away. And like, I, I don't even know what else I would do with my life. I would imagine it's the same with you. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> Brian, you well, were yeah, as, as, a, yeah. so, well, <laughs> as a youth, I mean, I mean, I'm sure we just talked about James Bond and, and when you got into cinema, like uh, what drew you into it? And were you always like uh, kind of find yourself locked into the to the scores and the, did you get a taste for that early? You know, completely not, actually. It was, it's very strange. I mean, I had no interest or uh, ambition to be a film composer at all. I was looking back in retrospect, I can see why I ended up doing that. But, you know, I didn't, I, I was not an expert on film scores. I wasn't interested in them. It happened to me by accident, though I've always been a musician. You know, I mean, I was a really horribly precocious kid on the, you know, learning classical piano, really obnoxiously good at it, very young. You know? Oh, were you? Oh, so you were, you were doing that? You were like, yeah. so you started like super early playing the keys? I started at the age of five, you know, like learning classical piano by the time I was eight I remember at a school concert and I you know I'd have wanted to punch me if I wasn't me yeah <laughs> but because you know all the other kids were like stumbling through playing a bit of Beethoven or Mozart or something at the school concert I had composed my own theme and performed it in the style of Bach, then in the style of Chopin, and then in the style of Rachmaninoff. You're like a fucking oh, wow. horrible, you know, it was very horrible. I was horribly good at it very early <laughs> on. But, um, you know, it wasn't It wasn't until I was about 12 that when I saw Jimi Hendrix on TV that I realised, do you know, I think, I think guitars might be, might, I think girls might like someone who plays a guitar better. Yeah. And I know. Isn't, the, isn't that how it always starts? Always. <laughs> and I know, I know uh, basically Jimi Hendrix uh, is a very big deal in your life. I think you've said that he was like your, the most significant person in your musical journey. Um, I mean, you named your son after Jimmy. I did. See, indeed. you know, yeah. Still so that way. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, so <laughs> Uh, growing up where you grew up, which I'm sure the Beatles were a big deal. Like, so what was like the bridge from like the Beatles to then seeing someone like Jimi Hendrix? Well, I guess it was, you know, you've got to figure how old I was through, through that. So when the Beatles first appeared, I would have been like seven or something, seven or eight, you know, and they were all cute and cuddly to begin <laughs> with. So, that was it. And I remember collecting, you know, um, you know, bubblegum cards, which they had the Beatles bubblegum cards, you know, which you'd swap, you could swap ones you had, you know, doubles of. And uh, so, so that was, you know, but, but then seeing Jimi Hendrix, and I think the first time I saw him was pro probably the first time he was on TV in the UK on the Lulu show. You know, Lulu was a pretty sort of middle of the road singer, but I remember him, him doing it. He was doing, um, He's supposed to be doing Purple Haze, I guess, but he played a few chords of it at the intro. And then he said something like, I don't think he said, oh, fuck this, but he said, you couldn't really use it. Like, oh, and he started playing Sunshine of Your Love, the Cream track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but I was thinking, this is what is what are you, you know this guy. What is this guy? He doesn't he doesn't give a fuck about anything. You know? yeah. But uh, that was my first uh, time. Of, really paid attention to Jimi Hendrix yeah yeah to me it was like a, a big deal as well and like years later like you know uh I'm 43 so um I, it was like one of the first cassettes that I bought and I remember at the age of 10 I think I've told this story um there was a movie with Peter Weller um called Shakedown and Sam Elliott and in the trailer um they had Purple Haze and I was like nine or ten and I never heard Purple Haze up to that point. And I remember recording the commercial back then because that's all you could do. I'm like, what is this song? And I would listen to that part because like once you hear there, 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 like I at that moment, I was just like, this is this is amazing, life changing. And I remember buying like the greatest hits cassette and, and everything on there. And it's just it's amazing how generational uh, it just keeps going on. Like, you know, it's 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 it, a, it, right. 
It, it certainly does. In fact, you know, I, I, I don't know if you checked out my Facebook page, you see that recently I've just been posting kind of funny things about music. But I just posted this thing today, which has um, well, it has a picture of the, the kid. Is it Josh, whoever it is from from, um, you know, the one that says, I see dead people. Yes, yes, yes. Um, um, yeah. Six yeah. Sense. yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Six sense. Only this says, I listen to dead people. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then it has like Jimi Hendrix and John Lennon. And they, you know, everyone's dead. That's yeah, yeah, all. Yeah. That's, that's, that's totally where I'm at with that. No, I, the I, list I, keeps going. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, the list does <laughs> keep going. Unfortunate. Um, <laughs> and, and I know, like you know, so later in life, uh, Transatlantic Records was like a, a thing that you know, like you're, you're a younger guy, you make a solo record, and and I was looking at the roster, and it's so funny. I see Billy Connolly. Yeah. And I, I remember growing up and watching like his HBO stand-up special. Yeah. And he would tell like this masturbation joke, and I would I would say it all the time. Because I thought it was the funniest masturbation joke. So, what do you remember about Transatlantic Records? Well, Transatlantic Records, you know, here's the thing. You know, I I I got pretty good at the guitar pretty quickly too, but I, taught, taught myself. I heard I it. I I heard some of the solo uh, stuff, and it's like pretty pretty amazing. It's sort of fast, you know, ragtimey finger picking stuff, and and that and Transatlantic the label. I knew nothing really. I just this was not. I didn't have a plan to be to do anything really. I didn't know what I was going to do, music or what. But I was at college, and um, there was a the friend I met at college who had a thing called a tape recorder, <laughs> you know, like a reel to reel thing. And he he said, "Oh, you know, I should record some of your things, and you should take them to a record company." And I was like, seriously, you know, what's a record company? I was so I was so naive and didn't know I didn't know what I was doing. So that we ended up doing that, and I made an appointment. I think I looked at the yellow pages under record companies. <laughs> Just you know, Transatlantic Records was one of these. I had no idea anything about it. I made an appointment and took this reel to reel tape in. You know, of some of my playing. Yeah, and of course, in predictable style, they put it. You know, their tape machine was aligned differently from. From the one I recorded it on, so what it, it had me plus what was on the other side of the tape playing backwards at the same time. They was probably thought I was fucking. Nuts. What, what, was it that big two inch? That two inch reel to reel? No, no, not two inch. Just like quarter inch, you know. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Stuff, but, you okay. know, like a your stereo. Yeah, yeah, stereo yeah, yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. But uh, rather like what happens in like in cheesy movies. Um, along these lines you know it was a disaster that they couldn't make out what i was doing on the tape but i had my guitar with me so he says to me well you have your guitar why don't you play for us so you know i so that's what i did and I, and it was just like so fortuitous and the the a and r guy said to me he said hello you know we're that's really good and we're making a, this double album of the best of british acoustic guitarists you know think of picking they had Bert Yanch and various other, you know, uh, John Remmel, who were very pretty good in that sort of folk blues scene. And they they asked me to do a couple of instrumentals on this sampler, essentially, of acoustic guitar music. Um, and mine sort of apparently went down the, as the most popular. So they offered me a record deal. I was still in my first year at college. I was, I was, I think I was still seventeen. Maybe I just turned eighteen, and uh, suddenly I had a record deal. You know, yeah, that's amazing. And and like back <laughs> back then, I know what a record label would do in the eighties, nineties, and today. Today, pretty, it's so different. But like back then, like what was the goal of the label? Uh, did they want you to tour, or was just it more of like a product? Uh, well, here's the thing. I think they spent more money on the sleeve than they did on recording, <laughs> recording my stuff. You know, it sounds appalling, but I, I, so I made this album. Uh, it's just quite port, fortunate, no, portentous is maybe the word to use. Okay, I made this album based on a book I'd been reading called The Mind Parasites. Is it by, by a, a sort of science fiction-y type writer called Colin Wilson? which was very also very based on HP Lovecraft, which is all strange because of the things it led me to later on in life doing movies. Yeah, yeah. But, um, so the album was it's really quite embarrassing to listen to, I think, personally. But they did put me on tour with quite big bands. They put me on tour supporting a band called Camel, who, who were sort of 70s, what would you call them, sort of prog rock band in a way. 
Um, and and probably all these bands used to love just having a solo artist as a support act. So they didn't have to have another fucking drum kit on the stage. Yes, yes, uh, yes. yeah, clever. especially you know, with, with their, <laughs> their their twenty piece drum set. Yeah, so so I so I spent a lot of time around that then, sort of supporting all kinds of, of ridiculously inappropriate people like Lou Reed and Soft Machine and Doctor Fielgen and things, you know, having to confront some quite hostile audiences, you know. So it was it was quite an education for me in terms of, you know, not getting killed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what what was what was Lou Reed like back then? I, I, you know, honestly, I think I only got like a cursory nod from him. It's not like a. <laughs> That's as good as you could expect, I think, from him. You know what? I've heard, exactly. I've, I've, I've heard stories, and I think you got. Could off be light. worse. <laughs> sure. I've got a better story for you about John Cale, though. Okay. Oh, yeah. Cale on the ground. Sure, I mean, sure. uh, skipping for a few years here, you know, when when, when I I had a band called Advertising, you know, which was coinciding, if you like, with with a punk with punk really um but we weren't a punk band we were more sort of like a pop uh let's say art pop more in the style of the new york what was going in new york at that time like, like, like the blondie. ramones oh blondie. not okay. the ramones but i'd say blondie i mean we okay. toured with blondie okay. a lot because okay. we were we were more of a kind of like a andy warhol inspired version of what pop should be rather than a um thrashy guitars spitting at everybody to Okay. Thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, so there was a plan. We got signed to EMI Records, and um, there was a plan to have John Cale produce us. So they flew John Cale over uh, from New York, and he came straight from from the airport to where we were set up in the rehearsal studios. And so he came in, and we, you know, kind of you know, shaking hands, and he's a nice guy, and blah blah blah. So. Um, he said, "Okay, you know, play play some of the stuff that you want to do." So he sat down. He sat down on the floor, and we're just set up. There's no audience, obviously. This is just a rehearsal studio. Um, and he sits down like that and uh, leans back against the wall, and we start playing the first song. Blah 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 blah. We could watch him. We were watching him as we were playing. You know, like really nervous, play, watching him. He's the only person in the room, and we could see him. And he's just flown over, you know, overnight on the plane. His eyes just started closing slowly <laughs> like that, and his head fell forward. By the end of the first number, he was fast asleep. Mm. So, <laughs> so I, we wow. start. We finish the first number. We start when we go. What should we do? Shall we, we, should we play another one, or shall we? He's, he's asleep. So we thought, okay, I don't know what we do. We'll go and have lunch. We're going to have you went to a cafe around the corner, <laughs> which we did. We just left him there, fast asleep, <laughs> on the floor. Yeah. That's, that's and amazing. when we came back, he'd gone. Uh, and that's the last we ever saw of him. That's uh, amazing. Can you imagine that? Like you're 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 there, and like this dude's like. I mean, by this time, he already had that re- some of that resume, right? Yeah. Uh, I can't imagine, especially like as a musician, even like when you're in a practice space as you're younger, and some yeah. of your friends come in there, you're like a little bit. You play a little bit more aggressive, and you're like, yeah. yeah. And yeah. you you look for like their reaction. You're like. Oh, Oh, okay, yeah. like, and that's the reaction we got. Yeah. <laughs> Man, yeah, blame it so on the jet lag. Like. That was a bit of a blow. Yeah, exactly. You know. Yeah. Anyway, well, there you go. What What was well, your first? Can I? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was I was just gonna say, like, I you know, in watching uh your your newer act, the the and I believe, yeah. right? Um, some of your YouTube videos, and you have such a there's such a visual element too. It reminds me almost of, of the early Pink Floyd shows when they had the the, the screen behind them and yeah. some and, and some of the visuals. Did you have like a visual element to your to your band back then in the early days? Did you have a sense for that, or was it just that came later? Oh, only wearing, uh, you know, because we were sort of this pop art thing is what we were trying to do. So the only visual element would have been me wearing skin tight pink trousers and a Starsky <laughs> and Hutch T-shirt. Uh, but uh, <laughs> so, no, is the answer. No, not at all. It was, you know, there was no, um, well, you know, I don't think projectors have been invented <laughs> then yeah. in terms of video. I mean, video. Mm-hmm was only right. you know just about there on, on vhs so no is the answer to that gotcha. but, you know yeah i was gonna say like so a, a, for for someone who grew up you know i think you were born in, in london england um 
when you come over, you said you, you toured with some uh, with Blondie. Like, what was what was the states like to you? What was the first impression? You know, to play well, we some- didn't tour. We toured in the UK and then oh. Europe with Blondie. Okay. So okay. we were there right at the beginning, just as they were beginning to break. Because I think they broke in England first. Okay. They 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 were number one with Denis Denis, which I think was their first single maybe i might be wrong with this the first one but that had just gone to number one so we were just supporting them touring around the uk and a few dates in holland and germany and stuff so that was it really so i so i touring the states is something that has still eluded me i you know i have played in new york and and i've lived in los angeles and played there a bit but um i'm now planning Oh, yeah, Dude, that's right. Let's, let's go. <laughs> I'll be there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But and, and another another thing that's pretty uh, interesting uh, that I wanted to touch on, uh, just to you know lightly touch on back then. I hate to kind of focus on on so early, but you know, in '77 when all this was going on, um, you know, you feel like the youth movement, and and today the youth movement is hip hop. Back then it was that punk. So like, what, yeah. what did you feel it? Or was it something that you were kind of like, uh, uh, n- not, uh, aware of until later on, or was it just like, yeah, this, this is our music. No, no, no. This is totally something I was part of because, you know, at that time when, uh, the band advertising, when we were getting all that together, you know, we were sharing rehearsal space with, you know, with the clash with, uh, 999 with all of those punk punk bands that were starting out so we were completely aware of it in fact you know i saw the i saw the the sex pistols do a very very early gig supporting eddie and the hot rods at a club called the marquee, marquee. and there was about 12 people there i mean you know wow. and but it was quite shocking to behold i, I was like fuck that's you know, that's that's a bit much actually i was thinking you know that's, that's really so we weren't sort of setting out to be punks or anything it's just that we coincided with with that time i mean i i i'm still friends with you know, a lot of the people glenn matlock from the pistols is you know i consider a friend and you know there's lots of people from all that time yeah so in the banshees people that I, I still know and 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 in a song that, that you know on your band camp so you have a band camp that people could go to and and uh, there was an EP that you put out so it's kind of like um just explain to people what would um uh was it blank records is uh you be flick records oh yeah flick. sorry yeah so that's, that's okay okay i mean like i'll just i'll just backtrack a little bit to what to 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 what you're saying about um what my band the and looks like and stuff and what it is about sure. i just explain you know that having been Principally, though I've been in bands and on that, I've been a film composer, which is what most people know me as, for like over 30 years. Um, and all over that time, I've been pondering, you know, how to do it live, you know, because film music's quite a particular thing because it's like playing yeah. with a film. So it's not the centre of attention. It can be really important to a movie. But so... Mm-hmm. It's not the, the main thing, you know, you've got big stars up on the screen and the sounds of gunfire and cars screeching around so, along with your music. So it's, a, you know, it's a collaborative thing, being a film composer. But I've been pondering, you know, how do I do it to do my stuff live? Now, if you are Hans Zimmer or you are, you know, you've written the, written the music for Lord of the Rings or some huge franchise, you can probably go around the world sitting in concert halls with an orchestra, you know, conducting an orchestra or having someone else conduct it. It's a pretty dry experience, you know, and for one, okay, none of my movies has been like a massive hit like that. I just haven't, I've done much more cult films and indie films and sort of uh, at a much lower level. So I conceived of it as something at a lower level so what i've done is put together a band and it's quite sort of psychedelic in the way that we we are performing it and the way that i'm rearranging some of the film music but we do have a back projection you know of of uh images from the different movies of the tracks that we're playing so it, in one sense it's what i would call revenge of the film composer because it's <laughs> i've taken like a whole movie and I'm gonna. I edit it to fit my piece of music. Oh, that's great. That, that, right. that, so, that, 
that's that's you know when when you go see a band for sure I, I, you know even like in festivals you know sometimes you're in the back it gets it gets like you know like people talk and stuff but I, I love I was watching some of the videos that you did and that's why um I brought that up because uh, I think you mentioned the Sex Pistols. So when the song "Close Your Eyes," like I was reading the lyrics, and yeah. it's funny because you know it's like, uh, first of all, the song you took from one of my favorite movies, so from Blade Runner, right? So, so it, it just explain like the connection between Blade Runner, Jimi Hendrix, and that song. Okay, that's okay. Uh, let me just just clarify a little bit. I think you're talking about. So this is very confusing, right? But there the, there is a an album I made called Close, Close Your Eyes, the album is called Close Your Eyes. There is a track on it called Time to Die, oh, yeah. which, which is, I think, the one you're referring to. Yep. Um, and that song, okay, is about people who famously died young, really. You know, there's this, they call it, you know, the, the 27 Club, these people that died when they were 27. Um, so my song is about people... And kind of what a waste that is, in a way, you know, the, it's kind of a bit romanticised that, that all these people died young and, you know, die young would be a beautiful corpse kind of thing. So the song is about that. But the, the phrase Time to Die, I heard in Blade Runner, right, it's the last words that the Rutger Hauer character, you know, character who's this replicant, as they call him, um, to the robot, it's the last thing he says in Blade Runner is Time to Die. You know, and he's, he's, the machine is dead. He's dead. Um, but there's also on Are You Experienced, the Jimi Hendrix album, you know, which I always used to listen to on head stereo. You know, this is the first true stereo experience I ever heard on headphones too, that album. You know, guitars sort of going, going around your head and that kind of stuff. It was very new back then in the 60s. Um, there's something that Jimi Hendrix whispers or says kind of quite muffled, you're going to hear on Heavens, and he says something like, I don't got to die till it's time for me to die. That's, that's just the words. So that's what this song is about. And um, on that album, I actually persuaded um, Obi Wan Kenobi, yes, um, you and aka <laughs> you and McGregor. To to do the rap, which I had, it's kind of a, a it's it's not exactly a rap, it's sort of spoken word. Yes. I, I'll res- I, 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 I'm very proud of the lyrics that i wrote for that i, I, I love i love the lyrics on there yeah, yeah. you like it good yeah, yeah. good i mean like i can recite one verse to you if you want to it's Do quite it. rude but yeah, yeah, I can, yeah. I, mean, I can be rude on this podcast can i yeah absolutely yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right, so, so so there's one verse which goes so this is about people that died young it's also it's a reply to the who's song my generation oh this where, i i love this verse go ahead yeah, yeah right yeah. where they say where they say you know um what do they say in my generation? They say, hope I die before I get old. Okay, so so the verse I'm, I'm thinking of goes, I don't want to be Sid Vicious, be a cunt, an OD, or get it on like Mark Bolan and wrap my mini around a tree. Don't want to take a jet and have some terrorist vomit, or die like Jimi Hendrix and make a meal of my vomit. <laughs> or Jim That's Morrison right. in the bath singing, this is the end. Or James Dean in a Porsche screaming, shit, here's a bend. Don't want my wife to be like Courtney and find my brains on the floor. Or be found hanging like a raincoat on the back of a door. That's uh, Michael Hutchins. Michael Hutchins, yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I, I read I wow. read I read those lyrics. I actually wrote that the, the Sid Vicious line down. Um, so when you mentioned the sex pistols, that's what reminded me of it. Okay. And it's it's very much like when I read it, like I get it, like because I feel the same way. Like I've written songs about wanting to be alive. I, like I don't want to die. It's like if when it's my time to die, like just like you, you got to find me to to tell me that because I'll be having a good time wherever you know. And that's it. And so and then then later there's lines which go so fuck Pete Townsend and the song that they sung. <laughs> I don't want to die while I'm still young. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And that's uh, so you and McGregor, too. Like, I want to get into Shallow Grave because I love that yeah. movie. But um, real quick, you know, yeah. our love of Rutger Hauer. I love yeah. Rutger Hauer. Um, yeah. Just growing up watching all his movies, Wanted Dead or Alive, I saw in the theaters. But also you did something for the movie Hobo with a Shotgun, right? I did. I did. Love- yeah. What a yeah, that's great, great movie. That is a great movie. They're so over the top. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, what I did, what, what we did was, 
um, they asked me if they could use a song, which actually I'd written for the very first film I ever did for a director called Dario Argento. And that, okay. that mm -hmm. film was called Phenomena. Hell yeah. And um, one of the songs I wrote for that um, is called The Naked and the Dead. And they just loved that song. So they asked if, if I could, you know, if I could do a, a remix of it and give it to them for a, a scene in Hobo with a Shotgun. So I said, yeah, yeah. I and mean, I thought it was a fantastic film. So, yeah, I was very yeah, pleased yeah. about I, that. I, yeah, when I, when I read well, that, I, I thought it was great. Yeah, you mentioned, you know, how you, you've done a lot of cult films. I mean, you've done some really legendary yeah. cult films. I mean, Hardware, Santa Sangre, and... and uh, uh, I have two. to mention that I was just going to mention uh, one yeah, of my favorite yeah. <laughs> film series of all time, the Demon series with yeah. with yeah. Bava. And I wonder if you could speak on. Um, and you just mentioned Argento when you got into uh, that Italian world of giallos and all that stuff, and how yeah. that came to be. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's it, as I said. You know, I didn't set out to be a film composer. It just kind of happens to me. Happened to me. But um, I, I at a certain point after the punk thing, you know, and the bands. That I had advertising, you know, it wasn't successful. And EMI Records, after one album and a couple of singles, dropped us. So, you know, I was sort of sat there thinking, what am I going to do? And various people encouraged me to to produce other artists to become a record producer. You know, so I did that for quite a, quite a while. Um, and one of the bands that I produced in the early '80s is a band called Livewire, who were kind of like a a rock band, you know in the mold of dire straits kind of you know mm -hmm. post punk but you know more musicianly shall we say anyway so i produced them produced a couple of albums with them and after the second album the guitarist uh, well he left before we did the second album and i did all the guitars on the album so the band asked me if i would go on tour a tour of italy with them that they were doing so i went with them and whilst i was there when we were playing in rome someone came up to me from a record company, from RCA Records, and asked me if I would produce uh, some Italian artists. You know, they they principally had, in those days, and still maybe have a lot, mainly of sort of singer-songwriters, singers, not many bands. They don't have that many bands, bands. But anyway, so I, I produced a lot of Italian records, and I was in Rome at the time, and I'd been invited to a party where I met this guy called Dario Argento, I had no idea who he was at all, nor could I understand the fucking word he was saying. I mean, <laughs> nor actually could my Italian friend. <laughs> was, you know, um, but between, you know, sort of in, between his, my bad Italian and his bad English, you know, we chatted and I know we had probably had quite a few glasses of wine at this point. But, and after about half an hour, I turned to my Italian friend who spoke very good English, actually, and I said, I'm not sure. I think he's just asked me to write music for his film. I'm not sure, though. <laughs> well, I think he did, you know. And this is, I think he did too. I'm not sure either. But you know, so anyway, it turns out that he had, in fact. So he, um, he, and apparently had seen my my band live play in Rome a year or two before as well. Mm -hmm. So that's what that, that's what happened. And he, he put me into his, the studio with a, the band that have done a lot of um, his best soundtracks called Goblin. Goblin, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, you know, so I started, you know, my first week sort of doing it was hanging out around in, in their studio, basically, doing stuff with them. But I, they were very stylistically different from the kind of stuff I was interested in. So I, we ended up splitting up and going into separate studios, but that's how that happened, you know. And um, was it so? This was like the oh yeah. So the phenomena was the, was the first thing, yeah. And like, um, I, I I love I I love your story just because I feel like opportunity knocks and and you are there. You know what I'm saying? Like you're, yeah. it's like it, you. you you take the, the the most out of these opportunities, and I feel like I mean, if there's a movie or a TV show here somewhere, I and I can't wait to watch it. But you're so in the very beginning, like, uh, do you just say yes, I could score something, and you figure, hey, I'm a musician, I could figure it out? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I had no idea really. I mean, obviously. <laughs> I was not, you know, I would never really, I was aware of some film music, you know, like The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. Yeah. Things like that. You heard, you go, that, that's pretty weird. That's pretty good. Cool. I like that. That's a, you know, but I wasn't one of these sort of nerds who was like, you know, I love the music from that film and this film and that, you know, and I, I was just wasn't like that. So you're right. I took the job thinking like you, you were just saying, 
you know, this sort of good luck. At, John Lennon once said, you know, life's, life is what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. Yeah. And that's kind of really true. Is it just, mm-hmm. that's what happened to me. And I, I, I grabbed it with both hands. And not least because it combined the two things which I hadn't really combined yet, which was learning classical piano and playing, you know, being inspired by Jimi Hendrix and then playing, you know, rock guitar. So I suddenly realized film music, you know, they put me in just the studio on my own <laughs> to do the stuff. I could do anything I fucking wanted. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's the yeah. scene that going on a piece of celluloid 35 mil tape on a loop. This, you remember, this is pre video when it started happening. Um, so I realized I could do some weird shit on the guitar. I can yeah. do some weird keyboard stuff. Yeah. I can make some really ugly sounds. You what, know, what is the science, uh, or or like, is it something that you just go as you as you learn um, f- to watch a movie and not overplay? Yeah, well, that's that's a very good point because it took me a few movies to realize this is not the same as being you know you being a pop star. This is not, or you know, a singer or singer songwriter. This is not you, the center stage of this thing. There's actors doing their thing here, and there's a director who's telling a story. Someone's written a script. There's sound effects. There's a whole lot going on, and it took me a few movies to kind of not throw the, to stop throwing the kitchen sink at everything, you know, like everything, because. It, it's sort of what I did because I felt insecure. I didn't know what to do. And it took me a while to figure out that if you look at a movie as just like a big sandwich, then the music in some scenes, you know, it's just a leaf of lettuce. Yeah. Uh, in other scenes, it might be a bit of chicken. <laughs> it kind of sounds a bit weird. It sounds, it sounds a bit more like Jodorowsky, uh, but uh, <laughs> with surreal. But, um, you know, that it, you're not, you, know, you don't need to do so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just need to do enough. You need to, you know, to make it interesting. And um, yeah, so that's a very um, good point to make. You know, it took me a while to back off a bit and be secure enough to not overfill it all with everything. You know, and you get you get some sort of direction or or um, yeah, some sort of direction from like an Argento who's pretty you know seasoned. Yeah, because the guy. guys you worked with are some real visionaries. You oh, know, yeah. they must have real specific there, there ideas. Are. Want, there, you know. there are, but you know, the really curious thing about it is that all of those guys didn't give me really any direction at all. I mean, uh, and I've realized over the course of done doing well over a hundred movie soundtracks at this point, God, um, <laughs> that you know, it's it's the it's the insecure directors who want to try and control everything, you know, because they just don't know if what they made is any good. I mean, the truth is, nobody at the stage at which I write music, knows if their film is any good. I, I don't, I've said, said this in many interviews. You know, they hire me at the moment of maximum paranoia, you know, when <laughs> literally they, they've, you know, they've got the money, that, which was like 80% of the, <laughs> the work, you know, then they've shot the film, the, you know, and done the script and all that sort of stuff. They're editing it by the time I get involved and they just don't know if the film is any good. So I'm the first person who hasn't stood around in a film crew, you know, you know, sweating in the sun or getting wet in the rain, uh, freezing your ass off. Uh, I'm the first member of the audience, in a way, to mm. look at this thing um, and give them some perspective on it. Now, I didn't dare tell the truth to begin with. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's very, I just didn't, but yeah, yeah. um, I get, I completely get that. It's just like, it's not, yeah, it's just, you're there. Like I wouldn't, I'd be like, yeah, like uh, you need me to do this score and my feelings. Yeah. And so I would just, you know, come up, but they didn't interfere. I mean, uh, Argento really didn't. I mean, the, the first thing I, that I ever wrote, it, you know, was a really cacophonous piece of nonsense. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> really fucking horrible, right? you know, it's full of screechy, horrible sounds, and be running the plectrum down the guitar strings and make, you know, really not horrible. And I asked them, Oh, can you get me a violin? They said, Oh, you play the violin. I said, No, I don't play the violin. Uh, I just made some horrible, horrible, scratchy sounds. So that that was for that phenomena. works in horror. That's yeah. for phenomena, yeah. For phenomena, really yeah. strange stuff in there. Cool. And, I, and when I played it to Argento, you know, 
I was really nervous, but I played to him. When it stopped, he said, it's beautiful. <laughs> mm. So so then, you know, I thought, oh, I can film music. You can do what the fuck you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it was like a, a very liberating moment for me. And the best directors, like I said, have left me well alone, including Jodorowsky. You know, if we step up onto Santa Sangre here, which yeah. was a, three or four years after um, the Phenomena, you know, he, he was somebody I had heard of. I mean, I had never heard of any of these Italian horror guys at all. But Jodorowsky, when I was at college, I'd seen El Topo, like in the early 1970s. You know, so I, I, I'd heard of Jodorowsky, knew who he was. So I was more nervous in a way of uh, being asked to do this. They're really pleased because I thought, you know, I know this guy. He's, he's really, he's really strange, but, you know, it's kind of cool. So I, when I met him, but he was so accommodating. He, the only advice he gave me, you know, was when I was trying trying to get some some advice from him, and I was saying to him, you know, there's a scene in Santa Sangre. This is this is not going to, you know, it doesn't matter if, if you haven't seen it, but where one of the characters has her arms cut off <laughs> by her knife throwing husband, you know, and there's blood spurting out of the shoulders, you know, and chickens on the floor licking up the blood and stuff it's really weird so i said to alejandro you know so do you want me to do something really horrible here you know and he looked at me like i was a bit mad and said no 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 this is like a moment of ecstasy for her having her arms cut off <laughs> i was like oh, oh yeah okay right okay but you know yeah. and when you see the film you'll understand pure you know, artist which... pure artist and, and what, what I what I love about all this conversation here, uh, one one of the last directors we had on was Tommy McLaughlin, and uh, he was wearing a Jodorowsky t shirt. And yeah. I asked him what his favorite live set was that he saw, which was Jimi Hendrix. So it's like right. I feel like oh. all of us like we, we're all gravitated <laughs> towards each other because we all yeah. love like the same stuff. So, but before we we talk more about that. Um, I did kind of like an Instagram deep dive on a couple of things and uh, there was a wham connection. Uh, can, can you tell me a little bit about that? <laughs> uh, uh, well, okay. Yeah. Well, okay. So in the early eighties, um, you know, I was, I was producing re uh, records and stuff, became a record producer. Um, but I got involved with a couple of guys who had an, uh, had a company writing music for, for TV ads, commercials. Um, so I, I wrote the music for God, must have been 150 commercials. I hated this whole world. I really, really did. I really hate it. But um, so one of the jobs I was asked to do um, for a commercial was for a um, a shampoo commercial, sort of a body, just like a you know, uh, and they wanted to me to remake Wham's. Wake me up before you go go, <laughs> right, with the staggering lyrics. Right, so the, the product was called Radox Shower Fresh. Okay, right. So they so some idiot, right, in the advertising agency, some copywriter had rewritten the lyrics. Right, and you know how the tune goes. Wake me up yep. before you go. And it's quite snappy. No, 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 Wakes you up before you go go. Radox shower fresh makes you feel right as rain. Oh man! And I mean, it's just nonsense, you know. It just it, it, you know anyone could tell you that doesn't scan. That doesn't fit the tune. Yes. So they wouldn't have any of it. So we had a whole succession of George Michael soundalikes coming into the studio. You know, I pre prepared the backing track, like tongue twisting themselves into knots trying to sing this fucking lyric yeah yeah because yeah. you can't like when you're writing something uh a melody like you know a phrasing just isn't gonna fit like you like you know it's just not so yeah and and, and the, the, then these other the idiots were in the studio with me so so one of these poor Mar george michael guys you know sam likes is going radio shower like, okay okay wakes you up before you go go radio shower makes you feel right as right and they go no 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 you've got to hear it's radox shower fresh so Ray Dog shower effect, and then you've run out of time. You know, you can't. It was just a nightmare. <laughs> and, uh, and we spent a whole day of this sort of torture before I think somebody checked back into the office and went, oh, 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 really? Oh, oh, okay then. 
oh, apparently George's publishing company might let us use the song. <laughs> yes. So, you know, after, after all, all that. that. So after that's, all um, that. So good. Yeah. Uh, I love yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's the world of advertising. Yes. Uh, but, you know, and, and luckily enough, like from there, like the, the movie – thing just kept going um santa sangre and and how do you meet um richard stanley well richard thought i was italian because <laughs> because Bos- Bos- you know, yeah. well yeah well actually yeah and what's weird is that the main guy in goblin is called claudio simonetti yeah. like simonetti oh yeah so, a lot of people thought i was claudio simonetti and that was my italian nom de plume that would have that, used... that, that would have been brilliant. Yeah. So he contacted <laughs> Richard Stanley. Contacted this. You got to say this was my for my first British film. You know, I was lived in London, and apart from Phenomena, the first film, oh. all the other Italian movies, and there's about 15, 20 of them before I did a British film. You know, through from nineteen eighty five, I I did, did about with, twenty with Lombardo. Uh, Bava. Yeah, Lambato Bava yeah, yeah. and, and Michele Suave, all these other. Um, oh, yeah, ideas. Stage Fright, Stage Fright. Oh, I, I just recently saw Stage Fright a couple of years ago. It was one of those movies that, you know, I listen, it, it, some movies just fall through the cracks. And, and thanks to uh, apps like Shudder, um, yeah. they, they, they reintroduce. Tubi. Yeah, and, uh, Shudder and Tubi are, are just yeah. amazing. Uh, and I saw Stage Fright, and because everyone's like, oh, you've never seen Stage Fright. And I'm like, Jesus, all right, I guess I'll watch Stage Fright. <laughs> so yeah. you worked on that film, so. Yeah, I did, yeah. But I was just like, all those other ones I did in London. I didn't do them in, in Italy. I would go to, to Rome and sit down and watch the film with the director and make a few notes, but you know, just t- then take back a VHS tape back to London. A VHS tape, which I might add, had no way of synchronizing with a a multi-track recording machine at that time. Well, that's right. Yeah. You know, so there's all these sort of ridiculous. So you'd have to you'd have to be like winding the VHS machine back to get get to the point where it's like, you know just recording. It was nuts, absolutely nuts. Um, I forget what point we were making here. But, Richard um, Stanton. Richard Stanton. Like Richard Stanton. Okay. So he thought I was Italian. He called uh, Argento's office in Rome and said, "Could he, they put?" him in touch with you know me and they said well he lives in london which is where he was filming hardware so he said really oh okay and so that's how that happened and 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 it's happened with lots of directors who are fans of argento basically i mean well and and jodorowsky richard stanley is one danny boyle was another argento fan uh when I was doing Shallow Grave, you know, this is why a lot of them were contacted me because they were familiar with all of these directors who I basically had no idea who they were. <laughs> so- yeah, I, I, I love Shallow Grave and I'm, I'm, I'm going to actually bring that up. But I just wanted to get like your first impressions of, of Richard Stanley, because uh, I think this was his first film. And uh, I mean, like, what did you think of Hardware when you first saw it? Well, I, 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 this, what's interesting also about hardware is it's the first British film I was asked to do because I thought no one would ever see any of these films that I was doing in Italy. I mean, there's a whole extra strand to this as well that um, I, I, you know, because of the VHS revo- revolution oh, yeah. that was going on, you know, yeah, and everyone yeah. was watching these things. But I had no idea. I thought it was my little secret that I could just mm. do this and a little side job. Like porn. Um, <laughs> by the way i've also scored a thing called pornography the musical oh really oh, yeah <laughs> which is a documentary musical with porn stars oh really i'll, I'll wow. talk about that later or okay. another time. yeah anyway so um all right where am i so where, what was i talking about Oh, hardware. We were doing, yeah, we were just, hard, yeah, yeah. When you first saw it, because I mean, like you. Yeah, so so it, they were filming it in London. So he contacted me whilst they were filming it, and he is probably uniquely the only director, there may be one other, who asked me if I would write a, some music that I and I hadn't seen anything. I'd read the script that we could play to the cast whilst they were shooting the film. Wow. This is a very that's, rare phenomenon. That's I mean, interesting. No, I can't tell you. It's yeah. really interesting. Because, you know, anyone who's been to a film set will know, you know, it's it, it, it's not exactly chaotic, but the it's pretty stressful. The directors, you know, got people asking them a question every 10 seconds. You know, shall I put the light? Where do you want me to put the, you know, where do, where's the boom mic? You know, you know, all this sort of stuff. Where do you want me to stand? Would you, so they don't usually want to think about music until 
this is why they don't contact me until they finish shooting it usually and are in the cutting room editing the thing. So, but Richard had the sort of foresight to, to say, can, you know, can you give, just give, give some atmosphere to the actors so they kind of know what we're doing here? You know, and I'd already started, you know, recording some stuff for him um, whilst they were still shooting that he was able to play to them, which is, which is a really good idea, I think, you know. So that's that's um, that that's what happened with that. So, but when when they finished cutting the film, then I go back and I can tweak things and and then be more inspired by the storyline and what has to develop through the film and what themes will come back and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and then from from there, uh, I know you guys did uh, Dust Devil. So I mean, I guess, and then you did something else after that too. I feel like you. I've done a lot of stuff with Richard. With Richard, Most, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I yeah. got it. I love his last Were you movie. involved in the uh, the Island of Dr. Moreau at all? Were you well, I wasn't, that? you know, and and uh, and uh, that was like rapidly turning into a nightmare. I, I was mm. kind of in touch with Richard up to a point um, in Australia. I think we had one phone call, but it, it, he was clearly uh, under a lot of pressure. If you've seen yeah. that, that, yeah. Documentary. Oh, yeah. that documentary, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> you fascinating. Um, but, you know, I've worked on pr practically everything Richard has done. Even the new, the like color out of space. Well, no, there's a, okay. there's a pretty difficult story to tell about that. You know, um, I mean, I Richard and I conceived and have talked about color out of space for uh, about t six, seven, eight, ten years. Uh, you know, even pitched the idea at, at, at um, Fantasia Festival in, in uh, Montreal. Wow, um, together. Unfortunately, the company that were making SpectreVision. I mean, who called SpectreVision, were making Color Out of Space, decided that they didn't want Richard to work with anyone that he worked with before, mm. which was, in spite of that, you know, Richard wanted me to do it. That doesn't even but make he was sense. Kind of, he was kind sense. of hijacked by them in a way. You know, um, and I'm really pleased for him that he's man he managed to get something coherent out of it all. But, you know, I was a bit pissed off obviously you sure. know because i worked with richard a lot and we'd done everything and you know and i supported him all the way through these difficult years he had of not making movies you know making documentary things sometimes you know and i would do i would do it for nothing for him so I, it was really kind of not very nice to have a film company step in and say you two can't work together yeah, that yeah. doesn't make any it sense. It doesn't make any sense. those no. partnerships with, Phil, you know, with a no. Danny Elfman and a Tim Burton or whatever. You go know, figure. That, go figure. Like, I, you know, I, I, I have no explanation for it. The business. The business, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but we have plans to work again together. Um, he has a few issues he's dealing with at the moment. But, um, yeah. Um, yeah. There's, uh, I really, I want to, uh take a break from the movies for a second i um i really like the the blink stuff like can you just tell us about blink okay yeah um so it's kind of, blink is is kind of art project you would call it um uh it had, how it came about was that i was sitting in a hotel room in los angeles you know a bit jet lagged like john kale <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so I was watch, I was watching the news, you know, and um, you know it's funny. Like you'll you'll realize this that the, the news programs when they come on, they always have a bit of music, you know, at the beginning, which either, especially in Britain, but either sounds like kind of pompous fake orchestral music signifying yeah, yeah. here comes the truth here's the truth coming for you you know or it's like busy 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 music you know we're busy collecting the truth from around the world for you so i was watching this thing and then there was this music going on and i was on my laptop as well i was watching the tv and then i i realized there was something going on the tv but there was still music going on there was some like car chase going on down the motorway um with the police chasing somebody which was on the live news but somebody had left a fader up so the music was continuing underneath it. And I suddenly thought to myself, that's really interesting because, you know, what I do for a living is manipulate people with music, essentially, yeah. writing music yeah. for movies. So what was happening here was music was being put accidentally under what is supposed to be the truth or, you know, factual stuff going on on the news. So I thought it would be really interesting if I 
did a project where I scored the news uh, as if it was a movie. Hmm. So I actually edited, this is how Blink came about. So I'll, tell you, I'll just give you 10 seconds more on this. So oh, yeah, I, yeah, for sure. I, I edited together my own version of the news. I went back to London and I, I licensed, you know, famous bits of news footage, 9-11, um, Diana's funeral, you know, Princess Diana, uh, the Berlin Wall coming down. And I, I, I edited to get my own version of the news and I scored the scenes with different music, but they, it was on a loop. And when it came around the second time, it had different music on it. So I was trying to kind of show if you put music on the news, it's like propaganda. It, you can manipulate the way you feel about what's going on with in, on, on screen because that's what I do for a living is I manipulate people yeah. essentially. So I had nine 11 and I, I met, I was showing this project to a guy who was the director of the, of the ICA, the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London um, with a view to do it. To, he, I told, I told him about it. He came down to my studio and I played him with it. And the first thing up was nine 11 and it came around with different things. So I scored nine 11 kind of how it looks on that classic footage, you know, with a jet coming in. So I scored it like, you know, an action movie. Wow. Uh, to begin with. Yeah. And then when it came around a second time, I scored it like a really sad piece, you know, all these people dying, sad. It was a pretty cynical way to do this, right? And then when it came around again, I scored it as a comedy. Now, <laughs> admittedly, this was only a year after it happened. So... That's a pretty insensitive thing to do, but I was trying to show, you know, how powerful music is in manipulating what you react, how you react to what you're seeing. No, um, it's it's. But it's, people it's, obviously felt that was a little step too far, um, and he said, "Look, I don't. I think it's too close to such a tragedy having happened for you to put that on, even as an art piece." So uh, I began to think to myself, well, "What?" And looking at all this news footage, you know, what can I, what else can I do with it? And and all the way through watching the, these 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 bits of news, I found these moments where people are being interviewed or whatever, where they're just looking at the camera, they're not saying anything, they're maybe being asked a question, and they just blink, you know, they're looking and they blink. So I began to isolate these moments of very famous people, political figures, pop stars, film stars just blinking and I slowed them right now and found a way uh, through digital editing to make them loop invisibly. So they don't have they don't go from here to there and start again. They literally hang very slowly like a portrait, almost like a photo, but it's moving. And then I scored because I did it on a very big screen, the little movements in their faces. <laughs> there was a twitch or something or whatever was going on. <laughs> so the whole thing became this series of portraits of people scored with music as if their faces were like a story. That's brilliant. And that's what Blink is. And I did it at the ICA in London. And then I did it in Hong Kong, projected onto the side of the, the Cultural Institute there. So, yeah, it's just an ongoing thing for me. The most recent one I've done was Trump, actually, three or four years ago. Oh, Somebody oh, who I... Do we, do we, I don't do want to get into it. I, 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 no, I don't, do, don't remind us. Yeah, don't remind <laughs> us, please. Oh, <laughs> don't remind us. Please. We're sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, what I love, you know, when we talk to people, you know, I love the influences that, that, that people draw from. And here you are watching TV and a mistake happens and you create something completely fresh from it. And, uh, <clears throat> I mean, that's that's if that's not art, I don't know what is. That's just amazing. Uh, so. no, well, thank you. I mean, I, I'm, I'm very proud of the, that whole thing. It's funny how I mean, I did that. It's nearly 20 years since I first did those portraits um, and technology has caught has really caught up. But it was quite fresh at that point to see a sort of slightly moving, very slow down you know, portrait of someone. So it's it was like extending the shutter speed of a camera from milliseconds to three or four seconds, essentially. Yeah, yeah. They were video portraits. I was inspired by Warhol, though, of course, had done his own version of of, the, of portraits of people where you just leave the camera on them for about an hour or something. 
I, rem- I remember watching Ministry's video for Just One Fix. <laughs> mm. okay. and, uh, there, no, actually, no, it was uh, NWO. NWO, and they, it was around the time of, like, maybe it was the Gulf War, and they would just have these images, and yes. this music was so, like, pummeling that I thought I was, like, yeah. I was, like, I'm having the a George heart George Bush at- samples. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. Yeah. And, um, and also, like, Just One Fix, I remember, because it had Timothy Leary, and I think you mentioned him. Uh, cause you had a, no, uh, a William Burroughs was in that. Oh, that's, one fix. that's yeah. who it was. You see, I don't read. That's my problem. <laughs> all, <laughs> all authors look the same, but, uh, you were just trying to make a link to Timothy Leary, who, yeah, I, had, who, right. who I have worked with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for, exactly. Like, for away. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Which not many people could say, but I think you can. So. <laughs> um, what, what did you do with him? Exactly. I don't even know. Well, this is a really weird thing that, um, there was, uh, when I was living in Los Angeles in the early nineties, um, my agent put me in touch with this, um, young lady who wanted to be a pop star, but in fact was an astrophysicist. Um, and her kind of thesis, her project that she was doing <laughs> that old story. That old story, yes. <laughs> um, she was was downloading sounds from outer space, like the actual audio, weird sounds, like whooshes and just sort of bleeps and all kinds of stuff. And so this coincides, you know, with the era where samplers were beginning to happen, you know, um, where you could record a second or two or if you if you had enough RAM in your sampling machine, you know, up to 30 seconds of something, you know, and you could make samples, which you could then play on a keyboard. You know, is this, I, I, uh, uh, this by the early, by 1990, you know, you could, you could do that. So I made sort of various of her pop songs uh, into, you know, created out of these samples from deep space, from outer space. Um, and we used them in some songs. In the and whilst this was going on, she one day she came into the studio and she said, um, "Oh, I just met this guy. I met this guy called Timothy Leary. <laughs> He's really interested in space. He's really in, interested in space, and uh, you know." Um, he's written a poem which he, he he says, you know, he would like to record him reciting the poem and if we could put together a track. So that's what we did. Okay. And I put together oh, the track. Awesome. She wrote, she kind of wrote the track, I produced it, I sampled all the stuff and made it made it happen. So what a uh, what a, a what a great credit. I mean, that is just such a like everything <laughs> yeah. when I when I tell you like that, you know, we've talked to a lot of accomplished oh, people. You're frozen on me. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. When when, when I bad. tell you, am I good? I think he's still frozen. Uh, he's still frozen. You hear me, right? I can hear you. <laughs> Sammy froze okay. up on that question. There. Okay. So, uh, so like I said, when it comes to like accomplishments, um, we've had on a lot of people, and you know, you're probably like the most accomplished person we've ever had. <laughs> oh, don't like, say that. I'm just <laughs> saying. I mean, like, I don't know. When you look at like everything that you've done, it's just like <laughs> this. This like. You know, it's, it's and, and it's, not even just what we've mentioned too. And just I started to jump in and stuff, but uh, talking about your credits and stuff that, that the Vatican commissioned you, right? For you did some work yeah. with the, are they big Argento yeah. fans too. Is they, <laughs> well, this is the weird thing, okay? This is the re- one of the weirder episodes in my career, okay? So, I obviously spent a lot of time in Italy producing, you know, some of their pop stars and writing music for a lot of Italian films. Come the end of the 1990s, my friend, my Italian friend, who's the same guy who was standing next to me when I first met Argento at this party, um, he, you know, he was carrying on working in, in the music business. But he he said, listen, Tom, I've had this idea. I was watching Pope John Paul II on his balcony and he, he started singing a Gregorian chant to the assembled, you know, Catholics below in St. Peter's Square. And uh, he said, wouldn't it be interesting to put his uh, Gregorian singing, and these are all, apparently, I am not religious at all, let alone Catholic. Um, I'm quite scathingly against a lot of it. But anyway, so he he proposed this idea of going to the Vatican and asking them if we could put some of the singing um, and indeed the speeches of Pope John Paul II to music and make it a bit more contemporary than you might think. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and at the time, I was so busy, I couldn't actually do that first. And they did make an album, and I didn't do that album. But a couple of years after it, um, 
in the interim, Pope John Paul II died, but they were they were making before he died. They were making a video with him, um, uh, and the video was being made by one of Italy's top pop promo makers. And I honestly can tell you, it looks like an ecstasy fueled rave video. <laughs> With, with the Pope walking across pink clouds and fucking, you know, colours all over the place. It's just completely mental. So the first thing they did was to ask me if I would write the music for this, this video. So I said, yeah, OK, fine. You know, what style? They said, oh, we'll leave it up to you. We'll leave it up to you. So I, I, I did some orchestral music for it. I did some trip hop. Mm -hmm. I did some, you know, like acoustic guitar stuff. Now, I'll tell you one interest is, I'll tell you, this is a very interesting thing that happened. Yeah. The first thing that I had to do was they, I had to set the Ten Commandments to music. Uh, <laughs> right. Wow. Being recited by Pope John Paul II. Now. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> first of all, I had to kind of watch them thinking, yeah, I've done that one. Oh, I've done yeah. that. I haven't killed anyone. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I haven't killed anyone. That's a good thing. Anyway, so so anyway, so the this is such a ridiculous story, but the <laughs> way the deal was being done, right, was that we were going to split split the publishing publishing, right? So that they would be the publisher and I would be the writer, the composer mm -hmm. of the music. And then of course, because there were <laughs> God's lyrics on it, or whatever you want to say. Um, so it was going to be, it was going to, you know, it was going to be 50 50, however, we did this. So it was going to be, you know, they would have the lyrics off the lyrics, the lyric thing of the songs, as they, effectively the songs, and I would have the music, and then we would split the publishing. Okay, so we would get 50 50. In the end, their lawyers turned around and said, listen, look, it's too complicated like this. Why don't you give us all the publishing and you take all the, all of the writer's share. So now on the on all the registration sheets, when this is registered as copyright, it says the Ten Commandments, words and music by Simon Boswell. <laughs> nice. So wow. I fucking you, shaft, own the you shafted God out of the I out own the copyright on the Ten Commandments. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. If wow. only I could really monetize this one. Oh, I don't know amazing. how to do it. I can't I can't wait to hashtag Vatican on this episode. <laughs> but um listen I, I i actually you know i don't want to keep you too long I, I i wanted to go um you know i think we covered what you're up to um there's one more movie that i did want to bring up actually before we we, we close up um what exactly did you do on abc's of death okay um well i was uh okay abc's of death a friend of mine called jake west was uh, doing a segment of it cool he was doing uh, s for speed um and and we were shooting it in uh california actually and uh so i was became very good friends with jake and i also helped put a bit of money into the production of it and and essentially was a producer on it as well but he i i also wrote the music for it okay so cool. That's that's really so I'm sort of down as an executive producer of ABC's of this. All right, good. I, uh, I, I love that, it. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. love the concept of that. Um, you know, so many uh, directors really get to showcase their stuff bo on both a uh, yeah. you know, one and two. So. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, yeah. and that's true. Your your music. Uh, you said you were booking shows. I mean, I don't know if there was anything else. You have anything any plans on coming to the States? Well, yeah, I'm trying to, um, together with Andrew, who I think, Andrew Hawkins, who you know, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We're, we're, there's various things going on. I probably shouldn't talk about some of them because he's, he's still planning them. Sure. Uh, right. But um, one of the main things is, it would be 2022 to try and do a series of dates in, in America with, with my band. Um, it's too early to say where they will be and, and how this will come about, but there, there is a plan to do that. I would imagine yeah. California. Things are really New York. Well, California yeah. absolutely would be but be right there. California, cool. New York, though New York. Don't forget us. That's priority. Yeah, New York. Yes. I did play. I have done one gig in two gigs in New York actually. Mercury. A couple of years ago at the at the the New York Festival of Psychedelic Film and Music. Okay. Hmm. 
there you go. That sounds pretty much covers what I do. Um, right. yeah. <laughs> so uh, can I just say, just a, a little plug. To whatever. Just, no. If anyone's Please. interested, right? Yeah, you know, I, 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 I just don't want to take up your time. So do whatever no, you no, want. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> just say, you know, a, a various of these soundtracks that we're talking about, I have put out myself on, yep. on vinyl uh, and CD and there's digital downloads too at Bandcamp. You yep. can get an awful lot more as well. But if you go to my website, if you find my website, I do have a shop trying, he said humbly, trying to beg for cents and pennies. Yes. Um, the, you know, if you want to buy anything. The, the, the You've got some great there. vinyl, oh, vinyl there. in there. Demons Santa too. Sangre. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So the Santa Sangre hardware. Demons too. They're they're all there for sale. If anybody's interested, so yeah. And, and, uh, and your tour dates are up there on what uh, will be updated. Well, on the that tour dates well. will yeah. come 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 right. when we try and do it. I can right. say now for all all those people who might be Italian horror fans, there is a plan for me to do a gig with Claudio Simonetti's Goblin. Ooh. First time we will have been together since 1985. But That's that, fantastic. That we're, we're trying, we're planning a gig in London. But if this idea works, and we would obviously do separate sets, but we do some stuff together, especially as oh, he did cool. Demons 1 and I did Demons, Demons 2. two. Yeah. So we might mm. like do something around around that. And Phenomena, of course, we did together too. That would be cool. Have you ever played like, because uh, I know like just recently, or maybe in like the last few years out in Brooklyn over at Nighthawk, I think they, they were doing like a uh, Night of the Living Dead with like a, like an actual band. Did you ever play right. to, 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 to like, do a live score? No, it's what I mean. I would do it. It's a, it's a hell of a lot of work. And the, and the problem I found with most of these older movies is it's impossible to get a version of the film with dialogue and effects, but without the music. So yeah. they generally just turn the whole yeah. sound down. And I just think it, it, I'm not sure what that turns it into really. I don't to just, know have music going through so i haven't really done that my version was to do these tracks of mine from the various <coughs> different films and by the way i went then and filmed jodorowsky and richard stanley and dario argento saying lines that i had written for them to say so they appear on screen as virtual guests in our live show as well so so the directors of these um, films are involved in the live show too very cool. Yeah, I mean, this, yeah. this is great. I mean, yeah. So we'll we'll check out the store. I'll put the links up and stuff, man. It's just yes. like, I mean, what 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 a career you've had so far. I'm sure you have another 50 years of awesome shit. Uh, anytime you ever want to come back and and like, you know, if you got the tour dates or you want to like anything else that you ever want to talk about. I mean, we have a lot. To, I, I, I'd be really happy to. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've had, you know, a long career doing lots of different stuff. There's 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 loads more I haven't told you yet. Yes, no, no, for sure. So anytime, like anytime you want to come back, just and come I, back. And and I know that it's like for for me, like I I, I always want to put focus on on the past, you know, that got you here, but also focus on the future. So hopefully, we covered a lot of the stuff that you've done lately. So and let me just say, you know, I've told you about my experience doing writing rewriting Wham for yeah. <laughs> a show <laughs> fresh commercial. Yeah. I haven't yet. Next time, I will tell you about me being asked to write a a theme for feminine hygiene products. Yes. Tampons. Part two. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, Part two. Simon, Please, thank yes. you so much. We're going to put thank this out you. Monday. You are fucking awesome. And I can't wait to talk to you again. Well, thank you yes. so much. I really enjoyed it. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Simon. See you again. Take care. Okay. Bye, bye. 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 Thank you.